Hey everyone, welcome to the next uh, module in the Theological Bible series. And this again, Bible is a kind of funny little acronym there, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Uh, in this module, we're going to be talking about understanding the Bible. So with this, the first thing to kind of think through is, um, you know, really the unity of Scripture, which I think is pretty powerful. Again, the Bible has been written over 1,500 years with 40 different authors, and yet the unity is fully in line. Now, I can't recommend highly enough this book by Ellen White, titled The Great Controversy. And in this book, she writes how God has given dreams and visions and symbols and figures, and all of those um, to whom the truth has been revealed have embodied the thought in human language. So what she's saying here is that the Bible uh, points to God of this as its author. And we can look to, while it was written by men, it was written under um, really direct influence from God. The Bible is consistent. It has one purpose, and the purpose is all about the salvation of man, right? The character of God is the same. The moral law is the same. It contains the development of one great you know, theme of salvation, okay? Um, this is because all of Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So 2 Timothy 3.16 um, tells us this, right? That every aspect of the Bible, and I think this is interesting, is that all of the Bible, all Scripture, is for instruction or reproof, right? And this to me means that no matter, even when I read really like obscure things in the Bible and people just like, eh, let me just skip over it. This makes no sense to me. Those are the ones that interest me the most because if everything in the Bible is there for a reason, um, anyways, I'm getting off topic, off topic here. So let's talk about how the Bible was actually given, right? In one way, it was given um, directly, right? We, we read how God spoke, you know, audibly to the prophet to write down ex um, in examples of Deuteronomy and Ezekiel and Revelation, right? These are direct God saying, write this, okay? Example of this is, I will raise up a prophet and I'll put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them that I have commanded him, okay? The next way is through vision. And so God shows the prophet a message in a vision or in a dream. Examples of this are in Daniel and Revelation. Another way is through impressions where God places an idea um, ultimately, and the writer uses their own words to explain it. So they're kind of, they're impressed about something, right? We read here that God guided the mind and the selection of what to speak and what to write, right? The testimony is conveyed through the imperfect expression of human language, yet it is the testimony of God. And so and there are instances where um, man has taken a concept, right, that they're impressed and then written it, um, in their own language, in their own kind of terminology. Uh, other ways is that God has led people to find truth in the Bible. An example of this is Luke 1, 3, where the author investigates and the Spirit leads him to the right sources. Um, 2 Peter 1, 20 reads that, knowing that no prophecy of the Scripture of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not of an old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake, and they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has um, been really the author of the Bible. And we read that Bible is not simply an anthology where there is a unity that binds the whole thing together. And when we actually, the more we pattern match the Bible, it's really ridiculous in the sense that we start seeing patterns that there is no way that human authors could even have caught that they were uh, developing this, right? And the chiactic structure, we're going to get to some stuff. Believe me, we're going to talk about some stuff today. All right. So who actually was the people used to write the Bible? And we found out the Bible is written from many different peoples, uh, different backgrounds, different circumstances. Some are writing from palaces, others from prison, right? Some others were on missionary journeys. Um, you know, men had different educational levels, different occupations. Some were destined to be kings. Others were simple shepherds. Um, some were old and some are young, right? The thing that they have in common is they were called by God and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this message. Those who had been taught of God communicated their knowledge to others, and it was handed down from the Father to the Son through successive generations. The preparation of written word began in the time of Moses. And so early on, God had communicated face to face, and then God had, um, people had been communicating from Father to Son. Um, it wasn't until ultimately um, the Israelites went into captivity and they were so surrounded by. Um, 
pagan influence that they started to lose track of the Bible. And so God had then, um, you know, the, I understand the Bible, but God's principles. And so uh, Moses had, God used Moses to actually say, okay, look, let's actually write this down. And he was the first one to start writing down um, what the Bible had to say. So again, uh, 36, you know, almost different, 40 different authors who wrote in three continents, many countries, you know, from all different walks of life. We can kind of read the different um, Bible, the different um, uh, the different authors and which, which books that they wrote in the Bible. And we see that majority of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, written by Moses, wrote the first five books. Joshua wrote a book. Samuel wrote uh, several books. Jeremiah wrote a few books. Ezra, Mordecai, and Esther. Um, Moses, again, wrote a book of poetry, right? Uh, David and then Ezra came in and wrote a few extra psalms. Uh, Solomon wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Songs of Solomon. Um, and then there's prophetic books. Isaiah was a prophet. Jeremiah, um, Ezekiel, Daniel, all prophets. Uh, most of those written in Hebrew. There's a few instances, like with Daniel, how Nebuchadnezzar writes a little bit in Aramaic. Um, then we read, um, you know, again, Hosea, Joel, Obadiah, Jonah. These are all kind of, um, um, you know, individuals that wrote a book that's named after them. We move into the New Testament, and now this is all written in Greek, right? So now we see uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all written in uh, Greek. The history of the early church was written by Luke, that's the Acts of the Apostles. And then Paul wrote a number of different letters in Greek. Uh, he wrote letters to Romans, and these are locations, right? To Rome, to Galatia, to Ephesian, right? To Philippi, to Colossae. You know, all these different locations that he wrote to. Then he also wrote some books to Timothy, his friend, to Titus, and then to the owner of the slave that he really liked um, and named Philemon. Then uh, there's some uh, more epistles here. So Paul actually wrote the book of Hebrews in Hebrew, uh, in Aramaic in the Hebrew there. Um, then uh, James, the brother um, of John, um, wrote the book James. Jude, the brother of Sorry, James, the brother of Jesus, wrote James. Jude, the brother of Jesus, wrote Jude. Peter wrote First and Second Peter. And then John wrote um, the books titled John as well as Revelation. So that's how it's broken down. Again, um, these were written by uh, people from really wide uh, range, um, you know, in mental and spiritual endowments. And the books of the Bible present a wide contrast in style as well as a diversity in the nature of the subjects unfolded. What's interesting with this is the way that um, Matthew, Mark, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all written from different perspectives. Some written from a perspective of informing the Jews, uh, the Romans, right? It's really interesting um, how each of them were chosen to really provide a different perspective uh, for this. So um, let's talk about the different Bible books. Let's jump in the next module. And let's talk about the different Bible books and their versions. So the Old Testament, again, was written in Hebrew, which um, except for uh, parts of the book of Ezra, as well as a couple chapters in Daniel, and one verse in Jeremiah, um, which were written in a Chaldean language. The New Testament is written wholly in Greek, with the exception of Hebrews. Um, the Old Testament, again, we kind of talked about this before, um, but it comprises these three main areas, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, and these are passed down writings. Um, these were confirmed with the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've kind of talked about this already. The Old Testament, um, you know, proves that God safeguarded his word for thousands of years, and this is uh, proven with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, among other, uh, other uh, um, uh, artifacts that were found. And it's objectively proven that the reliability of the textual transmission from the original text uh, even from the oldest Masoretic text to the New Testament that we have in our Bibles today are all um, done, um, you know, uh, perfectly. And there's not a single archaeological or scholar who disputes the Old Testament as a historical document. So, the New Testament is essentially a compilation of journals and letters. Um, when we kind of start with this, the journals, those who are, you know, following Jesus were providing historical record of events, such as Jesus healing the sick and teaching and things like this. And so ultimately these journalists, right, these people that are writing journals, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, all were providing historical um, events 
around Jesus. Again, we kind of talked about these different perspectives, right? Matthew, the Jewish tax collector, spoke to the Jews using kind of genealogy and facts, right? How he spoke to them. And we read Mark, you know, was really, his audience was the Romans. And so he used more contextual storytelling. Uh, Luke, who is actually, you know, more uh, targeting the intellectuals, you know, the Greeks, right? He used an orderly account of journalistic manner. And then John was actually speaking to the church itself. And he used more symbolism and, and selective in his accounts. What's interesting is that their audience was different. The description of Jesus was different. Um, and, you know, they had a different lens. And ultimately, I think, used kind of different rhetoric. And I may be... Um, I think I match the rhetoric, right? But I think, you know, Matthew is mostly Logos, you know, John Ethos, I believe. Um, Luke could have been maybe Pathos or um, Ethos. Um, I don't know, really sure how we would, would align uh, Luke, but um, maybe, it was, maybe it was more uh, Logos even. But anyways, I think roughly they're using different uh, methodology. The description I think is interesting. Uh, Matthew calls, you know, uh, God the son of David, because in his audience of the Jews, David was, you know, the lineage that the Messiah would come from. And so he's really um, showing how Jesus is the messianic king. Mark, right, talking to the Romans, he's talking about how he's the servant of men, right? Luke's talking about how Jesus is the healer. Luke was a, was a, a doctor. And so Luke is talking about the, you know, the son of Adam and Jesus being the healer. And then John is talking about how Jesus was actually sent from God to reveal God. I love plotting things out. And if you've taken any of my courses before, you'll see that everything has to be plotted. And so what's interesting is that, you know, Jesus is God and man. He is king and servant. And as we kind of just start seeing these, uh, you know, really this pattern unfold throughout the Bible of the different roles of Jesus. Anyways, to me, I think this stuff is really interesting. Okay, so... In addition to the journals that we call the gospel, right, the four, um, you know, the four writers of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in addition to the gospel, there were also letters to churches, to church leaders, to other people, okay? And these letters were really built around, you know, encouragement and reproof and things like this. So the, um, the first four... Um, um, and most of the New Testament is letters from ultimately church leaders to very, you know, um, letter to Rome became Romans, Philippi, Philippians. We kind of talked about this already, Corinth, Corinthians. And then there was additional letters to Philemon, which was a petition for a runaway slave who was a Christian, and Timothy as he kind of passes the batons uh, to Timothy. So Paul wrote a lot of letters as well. Now, these letters ultimately formed what we call the received text. And ultimately, the letters and the journals were all gathered together, and they were copied, um, you know, with a, with a great amount of pride, and into kind of a a larger manuscript. And so these individual letters got formed together into a book, so to speak, called the Texas Receptus or the Received Text. And you know, the received text was ultimately the, um, you know, what we consider the New Testament today. And um, this was passed from generation to generation, and it was copied very faithfully and preserved. And this was done with earnest and great responsibility because they were carrying the legacy of God. And there were instances, in many instances we'll talk about, where people that were carrying on this, this book, this Texas Receptus, were killed over having it and killed over translating it. And yet it's still preserved. There's a people called the Waldensians, we'll talk briefly on them a little about here, as well as the Abagensians, Ab Ab um, I butchered that, um, as well as ultimately when Wyc uh, Wycliffe got his hands on it, right, then Erasmus and then Tyndale and Martin Luther, um, the Geneva Bible, ultimately forming the King James Bible. So there's a direct lineage of the Bible being preserved, the Texas Receptus being preserved throughout this time period. And again, this is the uh, the New Testament. The Old Testament was, um, uh, there's no question that was preserved by the Jews as well. But the New Testament, uh, the Texas Receptus being re preserved by these letters and, and journals um, of people that actually knew Jesus firsthand. So again, these were 
um, examples of like John the Revelator, Polycarp, Irenaeus, Waldensians, right? all of these kind of um, these paths, right? And as people were, um, you know, uh, storing this, they ultimately became persecuted. Um, the Waldensians were the first of the people in Europe to obtain the, the translation of the Holy Scriptures, and they had the truth unadulterated. This rendered them special objects of hatred and persecution, ultimately by, by uh, Lucifer and and those that are trying to uh, stomp out early Christianity, which was the Romans. So the church in the wilderness, the Waldensians, and, and not the proud hierarchy enthroned the world's greatest capital, was the true church of Christ, the guardian of the truth, of the treasures of truth, which God had committed to his people uh, to be given to the world. There's a book called um, Truth Triumphant by B.J. Uh, B. Wilkinson that kind of documents really a lot of this chronology um, as well. But to know that censorship of the Bible has been really an ongoing um, thing, right? Throughout the ages, the deceiver's been trying to get rid of any trace of God. And the Bibles were targeted as part of a bigger program to wipe out Christianity. Um, early on, we find that Diocletian ordered the destruction of the scriptures and any of the books across the Roman Empire. So um, Emperor Diocle Diocletian said that no one's allowed to even have a Bible. And he ordered that all of the Bibles be destroyed. So we actually read that that's continued in the Diocletian persecution where more than just uh, destroying Bibles, uh, he actually started to, um, you know, sacrifice, um, you know, Christians, right? Uh, and even required, uh, demanded that, um, um, that everybody sacrifice to other gods. And so there's this kind of misconception where people think, well, um, you know, oh, that was the Catholic Church that was, you know, uh, oppressed during this period. But to be clear, this was done by the Catholic Church. This whole segment, and now granted, you know, the Catholic Church wasn't even you know, truly formed. It was done uh, more specifically by the Roman papal, uh, by the, you know, the pagan Rome. Um, but this whole movement continued through papal Rome. And so, again, this was the eradication or the attempted eradication of um, God's true people. And we see that the same church who, you know, massacred countless Waldensians, um, you know, God's people, um, were ultimately raised, right? And this, um, Waldensians were raised up to safeguard the received text. And so, um, yeah, again, there's, there's a lot of really dark history uh, around this time period. Um, the Vades or the Waldensian church resembled, you know, the church of the apostolic times. They were, they contended for the faith, you know, the church in the wilderness was the true church of Christ and the guardian and the treasures of God, the keepers of light. Uh, what we really find out is that, you know, the, the Waldensians were some of the um, greatest, um, you know, without them, we would not have had the Texas Receptus, right? We wouldn't have had the New Testament without them. And they guarded this with their life. And those that carried the light were hunted down and murdered by ultimately, um, papal and uh, pagan Rome. And so this is, um, again, kind of speaking this idea that those that have, you know, carried the truth of God have been um, severely and eagerly persecuted against. This carried on throughout the 1600s with King Louis XIV, uh, you know, forcefully conversing, converting Waldensians to Catholicism. You know, they were forbidden to have religious meetings under death. You know, all of their goods were taken away. Their children were forced into training as Roman Catholics, right? I mean, like, the stuff that we read here is disgusting. And the Catholic Church has a really, uh, you know, has played a role to try and is extinguish Christianity. Um, there's a book called History of the Waldensians by James A. Wiley. Highly recommend reading and learning about the history of this. Also, I really recommend uh, Waldensians, Israel, um, Israel of the Alps. Um, YouTube that as well as um, learning from James Arabito, who has provided a lot of research and really powerful discoveries around um, what was happening during that time period. Now, in 11, backing up a little bit, in, in 1199, Pope Innocent III stated that the Bible could not be understood by anyone who was not properly trained. But again, this goes against what the Bible teaches. And so 
um, you know, we read here again that we are to study to show ourselves approved, right? We are to study and think for ourselves and actually read the Bible directly. And so when we see that, you know, how the powers um, of Rome and the Roman Catholic Church were trying to stop people from reading the Bible and ultimately trying to eradicate the Bible as a way to get rid of Christianity. But we are not to pray to man. We are not to have man. I, you shouldn't look to me to interpret anything. This is just to get you started in, in, on your journey to go and, and study this stuff for yourself and see what's true for yourself. We should not be looking to man to teach us, but allow the Holy Spirit to teach us by comparing the Bible to itself. Right? As we start, and we're going to talk about this later, but we really have this ability to um, allow the Bible to unlock itself. We don't need man to translate it and interpret it for us. We find in the Council of uh, Toulouse how you know, they prohibited the Old and New Testament. So again, we should be able to prove at this point that those who preserve the Bible have been attacked and that there's been concerted effort to eradicate the Bible. We read in Matthew, For I have given unto them my words that thou gavest me, that they may believe us as that thou did send me. And God has said that his words will not pass away. And this is why the deceiver failed to suppress the word and instead decided to start counterfeiting it. Now, this is interesting because up until this point in time, the effort has been to persecute, to in, imprison, and even to kill Christians. And then there got to a point in time, and you know, when we look in 325, um, ultimately uh, in, that, uh, in the early 300s, with Constantine finally said, oh, you know what? This isn't working. You know, the Diocletian persecution lasted for 10 years and more Christians were popping up during that time than ever. So instead of, um, you know, instead of uh, outlawing this, let's just infiltrate it. And so we read that um, Lucifer proposed to change the Bible. And we'll read how this happened. Uh, we read here that there's no cutting out of the scripture, no mutilating the word as the Catholics have done. The Bible is to be searched as a whole. Okay? Uh, we read that there will be those who will come weary of hearing repeated the things that they ought to do but desire not to do it, and they will want to change the wording of the Bible. So what happened? Understanding this agenda, right? Constantine in 331 wanted to merge paganism with the early Nazarene or apostolic church. And the way that he was able to do this um, was by uh, ultimately um, you know, through the Bible. But let's we got to understand um, who Constantine was. So Constantine said that he was a convert to Christianity, and yet it was just political because he still maintained the title Sol Invictus. And Sol Invictus is the official sun god of the Roman Empire, which dated back to Nimrod, right? So despite a concerted effort to revise history, Right, like this merge with paganism um, becomes ultimately clear that we can track this date, December 25th, Christmas, right, which was first declared as a day of the sun god, then for the birth of Jesus, a date which is clearly not about Jesus and his actual birth. And we can get into that later. But it's just interesting that we start seeing how, you know, the worship of the sun, the worship of paganism, has been merged with Christianity. And we're going to talk more about this in, a, in another course, but really this idea that, um, you know, Constantine had written 50 Bibles. So he commissioned 50 Bibles to be written and, he, and, he, and commissioned Eusebius to write these and made for the use of the Bishop of Constantinople, etc. So what's clear is that Constantine says, okay, we're now going to create um, these kind of 50 counterfeit Bibles that are going to, they're going to water down and dilute much of um, Christianity, right? And then we're going, to dis we're going to send these out to everybody and then remove the Bibles, you know, burn everything else that, um, that people have. So Eusebius, um, who, uh, so Constantine hired Eusebius, okay? 
Eusebius, we're going to learn about who he is in a little bit, he was then hired to create these 50 Bibles and then distribute them out. Now, Eusebius used somebody who was already prejudiced against Christianity and had questionable accuracy. Interestingly enough, he got his um, information from Origen. Okay, so um, Origen was his kind of, um, you know, his guru. And Origen taught a bunch of really weird things, including Aaronism, etc., and taught that Satan would eventually attain salvation. He believed in reincarnation. Ultimately, this, this guy had no affiliation to any sort of biblical doctrines. He was a straight out pagan, and yet that's who Constantine used to uh, do, you know, ultimately forge these 50 Bibles. So Eusebius was contracted for 50 Bibles. He was a student of origin who had many doctrinal differences you know, from anything you know, remotely uh, related to early Christianity. He didn't believe in the resurrection, a bunch of stuff. 331, Constantine, as a way of suppressing the, you know, the divinity of Jesus, ordered these books be sent out, probably to the most 50th you know, influential cities at the time. And those were then formed into what people were using as the Bible. So all these different codexes, which we'll call now you know, a book, um, were sent to different locations, and we've identified, and we've kind of, um, you know, Codex Vaticanus as an example. Uh, that was found in the Vatican, right, et cetera. So that would have been a book sent to Rome. Codex Alexandrus was sent to Alexander, okay? So again, um, we read that um, these, we've been finding now, uh, these Bibles have been discovered. So, and we, we can actually see the differences from them and the received text, the original King James. And, and these kind of been popping up over, over times as, we've, as they've been discovered. In fact, Codex Vaticanus was actually found in a trash can in the Vatican. Um, and here's the guy that found it. So interestingly enough, um, the, in the 1950s, there was a new Bible formed. And a, uh, two men, Westcott and Hort, formed this new Bible based off of the Codex, right? Based off of essentially the 50 Bibles that were paid for by a pagan sun worshiper, Constantine, okay? And these were um, translated, again, you know, kind of a, you know, modernized and, and uh, formed into a new Bible. So who are Westcott and Hort? If we research into Westcott and Hort, and again, we just have to look at their own... Um, their own biographies, right? We find that they were members of spiritualistic movements, you know, members of the Ghost Society, um, whose you know mission was to uh, you know inquire into phenomena and the supernatural, right? Um, they were um, you know part of secret societies. Like these guys were were occultists. Okay, they even read. Um, the positive doctrines, even the evangelicals, seem to be to be perverted. Okay, there are, I fear, still serious differences between us and the subject authority of the Bible. So the guys that are translating the Bible don't believe in the authority of the Bible. Pretty odd guys to be creating new Bibles. At present, many orthodox but rational men are being unawares, acted upon influences which will surely bear good fruit in due time if allowed to go on quietly. I fear that premature crises are frightening these back to mural traditionalists. You know, these guys say that heaven is a state, not a place. I could never understand how one reading the Bible could uh, understand things like they did, the embodiment of truth. Uh, I reject the Bible's infallibility. Like, these guys are, you know, not even believers of the Bible, okay? Um, these guys were spiritualists. They believed in evolution. They hated the Texas Receptus. And yet these were the people that set out to form a new Bible. Pretty odd. Based on comparing the West Cotton Hort's version and the Texas Receptus, they changed 7% of the Bible. That means that the 50 Bibles of Constantine plus any of their changes were about 7% of the entire Bible was changed. That's 5,000 changes, removing words, adding words, and changing words. Interestingly enough, and this is, I don't know, super just ironic, that the Bible says in Revelation twenty two nineteen that if any man will take away the words of this book, God will take away his part out of the life, the book of life. So, if you change the Bible, you will be, um, you will, you know, God will will punish you for that, right? Ironically enough, this we'll find out later. They actually changed this verse, but that's okay. So 
their Bible was actually used, Westcott and Hort's Bible, these out-and-out spiritualists, their Bible was used as a basis for new Bibles, such as the New World Translation, American Standard Version, which became the Living Bible and the Revised Bible and the Amplified Bible. So, and again, this isn't anything like, like, you can find this out. Just go and look. Just open up any of the Bibles and look at their textual basis. And it will tell them where, you know, essentially the copyright comes from, right? What are they based on? And New World Translation, American Standard Version, all based on Westcott and Hort. So we find that there's a new group of Bibles come out um, from Nestle and Ant. And this new uh, version, they take some of Westcott and Hort, some of the 50 Bibles of Constantine, and then form out the New International Version. So Nestle and Ant created an NIV based on Westcott and Hort, spiritualist, and based on uh, origin and Eusebius, you know, forgeries of the 50 Bibles of Constantine. So it's just kind of crazy that, you know, the Nestle and End, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not like this is any secret, right? It's very clear they did this. Um, again, St. Jerome with the Latin Vulgate. Um, so what we find is that these kind of, there's a, um, a family tree, so to speak, Right, coming from the 50 Bibles of Constantine into Westcott and Hort in the New World Translation, American Standard, etc., as well as in the Latin Vulgate, which turned into the Jesuit Bible, doing Reims. And so we find that there's all these Bibles that are tainted, and then there's, there's one Bible that has been kept pure, the King James Version. So why all the versions, other than, you know, a, a sinister plot by Lucifer? Um, you know, well... One reason is that there's tons of Bibles sold every year, so follow the money, right? Anything over 70 years is in the public domain. That means that, um, you know, it's not the only reason, right, but it's definitely an incentive for people to keep publishing new Bibles, or keeping the copyright active, and just keep pumping in the cash, right? Even the Texas Receptus is being capitalized on with the new King James Version, which has nothing to do with the King James Version. It's very, very different. Um, new King James is, we'll find out, pretty much like the NIV. So it just takes the name King James. All these copyrights allow them to make money off of this. Um, and the second reason is the agenda, right? This is literally from the Vatican website. Collaboration for the diffusion of the Bible, okay? Promoting the ecumenical collaboration for the translation and diffusion of the Holy Scripture. So the society, United Bible Societies, that's actually the one regulating Bibles is from the same exact organization that, you know, several hundred years ago was killing people for having a Bible. A little bit odd to me. Here's some of the books that are translated um, by the UBS. <coughs> I've shared this before, but it's pretty telling that in the New American Catholic Bible, 1974 edition, it literally says, here's an index of forbidden books, and one of the books is the King James Version of the Bible. So it's not some like it's not some sort of weird conspiracy that the Catholics hate the King James. It's right in their book, right? They are trying to exterminate the true word of God. And let's explore what the differences of these Bibles are in a little bit. But really the point that I want to point out is, is that there is a lineage. Um, Walter Weith does a, a good... Uh, presentation on which Bible. Um, you know, it's interesting how, you know, people think, well, you know, like, it doesn't really matter which Bible you use. And I've been in, in churches where, you know, the pastor says, oh, it really makes no difference which Bible you use. And there's one aspect that I agree with, okay? Um, I personally own a New Living Translation. And I think it's nice to read kind of as like, um, like fuzzy stuff, like if you want to read, um, you know, maybe stories of Jesus, or if you want to read, um, you know, maybe like Psalms and stuff like that, it, it's kind of just nice, it just flows well, okay? But I would never, ever use any other Bible other than King James to do any actual doctrinal research. So if you want to read it for a morning devotional, cool, right? Like I think you'll get benefit out of it. But for someone to say that it doesn't matter which Bible you use, if you're trying to understand doctrine, right, that is heresy. Let's actually show why some of this matters. So we read that every word that precedes out of the mouth of God, 
right? Deuteronomy, Matthew, we must know what is the full word of God. We should know exactly what God has inspired to write, not a secondhand collection of impressions of what God says. If I want to know what God said to me, I want the most authentic version of his words. Also, the Bible contains a covenant, right? We are, it's a covenant is ultimately a contract. And so if you have a contract that involves your eternal life, you'd want to know exactly what that contract has to say. Not just generally a paraphrase. Don't tell me kind of, you know, generally what the contract says. No, I need to know the details, right? And things matter, right? You know, an example, ye is in plural form. So it's translated to Moses. That's incorrect attribution, okay? Um, little things like this that actually make a big deal. Contracts don't include punctuation as it infers context, right? And so when the, the, the punctuation was added, which it didn't include in the original version, as an example in Luke 23, 43, that punctuation was added. And that little placement of the comma has actually created um, a big stir, right? Here's an example where adding a comma changes the context of what Jesus is saying to the thief on the cross. So he said, today I tell you that you will be in paradise. If we move the comma before today, it seems as if today he would go to paradise that day. But we know that's scripturally inaccurate because even Jesus didn't ascend to heaven for several days. Okay? So again, it's really interesting how um, these little nuances can make a pretty big difference. What we find is that um, this is how Lucifer tricked Eve. God said, don't eat of the tree. And Eve misquoted and said, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither touch it, lest you die. But God never said not to touch it. He said not to eat of it. And so Lucifer picked up on that point. And, the, and Lucifer, as the serpent said, uh, you know, you, you can actually touch it and you won't die. And so he put one in her hands and she's like, oh, wow, I didn't die. Right. So now you can go ahead and eat it right? Because you didn't die by touching it. So that's the importance of understanding really what the Bible has to say, okay? Eve added the words, neither shall you touch it. And she omitted the word every, freely, okay? So she substituted, lays yeast ye die, for thou shalt surely die. Now, when the word of God is changed, deception is able to be introduced, and so I think it's really important, the danger of paraphrasing um, is discussed, right? We've all remembered kind of like that game of telephone back in the day where like somebody would whisper in someone's ear, they would whisper in the next person's ear, and at the end of it, it's super silly, and we all are up way too, much, way too late drinking too much sugar, okay? Do we want that with our Bible? There's different types of translations. So there's word for word. That means that every word is translated directly. Um, as an example, here in Romania, they have the Fidela uh, Bible, and it's a little bit hard to read, as I understand it, um, because it's a, it's a word-for-word translation, okay? But it's accurate. Then you have thought for thought and paraphrase. Now, thought for thought is going to take a thought, right? Take like a group of words or a sentence even, or a couple sentences, and then, um, you know, translate that in a way that can be uh, understood. Paraphrasing, however, is literally just somebody inventing their own words, right? And the message, which is, you know, completely just random thoughts by a random person at that point. So for me, I'm looking at the King James Version. Um, the next thing is going to be, um, let's kind of just take a few of these. Okay, in Acts 37, or Acts, sorry, 8, verse 37, we find that an entire um, verse is missing. A verse that gives clear context that baptism is to come with a belief that Jesus is the Son of God. So this is the work of Constantine. This is the work of Eusebius. This is the work of, of uh, Westcott and Hort. This is the work of Nestle and Ann. They have um, willfully neglected to keep a verse in the Bible. There's going to be a lot more, believe me. Okay, This is just an example. Philip says, if you believe, and I believe Jesus is, uh, Christ, you know, if you believe in all your heart and they may, he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Why was that removed from the, from the NIV? Pretty crazy. Mark 10, 24, where you see that the words, for them that trust in riches, was completely removed. And this distorts the context, as it's not hard to be saved if we are not clinging unto the world. 
right? This is a falsehood which makes it seem like it's impossible to accept God's gift. So again, reading here, the disciples were amazed at his words. And Jesus says, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. No, he didn't say that. He says how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Do you see how that's completely different context? As if it's impossible to, to go to heaven. John six forty seven. Verily I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. No, the one who believes in Jesus. So why was Jesus removed? Philippians again. We can all do things through him that strengthens. Why is the name of Jesus, the strength, the name of Jesus is being removed from the Bible? Through the blood of Jesus. Right? Why was, you know, you'll not find any reference to blood of Jesus in pretty much in, in the NIV. Every time it's been stripped out because there's power in the blood. 1 Peter 1.22, through the Spirit was removed. Right? Now you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you, no, by obeying the truth through the Spirit. Right? These are major things in terms of really understanding Christ. Now, they're not major things in terms of the bigger picture, um, right? So you could say, yes, you'll still get the, the general idea of the narrative that Jesus died on the cross, et cetera, et cetera, but you're, move, you're missing out on all of the context, okay? Why is Jesus, and, and, and also you're missing out on this instance here of righteousness by works, especially righteousness by faith, Luke 6, 48. Because, uh, so when a flood came, the, uh, the torment struck on the house, they could not shake it because it was well built. So a well-built house is righteous by works versus for it was founded on Jesus, right? The Lord is my rock in Psalms 18.2. So it was founded on the rock. It was founded on Jesus. That's righteous by faith. That is salvational. That's a big deal. King James, um, God will provide himself a lamb, okay? That's removed in NIV. And in, and in, um, in the New King James, it's even weirder, Right? God will provide for himself. Jesus doesn't need a sacrifice. Jesus has never sinned. It's just so weird. Matthew 20, 20 um, removes the divinity of Jesus, removing, you know, uh, just saying kneeling down, not saying worshiping him. Romans 3, 22, um, this is a powerful one. We need the faith of Jesus, yes, but we need the faith in, you know, we need faith in Jesus, but to have the faith of Jesus is so much more, Okay. So again, changing of and in, um, super nuanced here. Again, pushing this justification by works narrative. Um, Mark three twenty nine, that um, don't blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. Um, never has forgiveness, but is the danger of eternal damnation. Um, and over here, you read um, will never be forgiven and is guilty of eternal sin. So the NIV says that if you ever blaspheming against the Holy Ghost, right, that you will be lost forever. And look, the rejecting the Holy Spirit is the impartable act, but that's this idea that you rejecting God working in your heart. If you say, I don't want, like, I want God, I want free will, and I don't want you working in my heart, right, which I don't. I want God working in my heart. I want the Holy Spirit to continue to, to uh, change me. But if you were to say something like that, um, yes, that is an unpardonable sin. But to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and then think, oh, wow, I'm never going to be, I'm, I'm, it's over, it's over for me. No, that's what the Lucifer wants you to think. And so we find the NIV is ultimately uh, these nuanced little areas where the, where, where the deceiver can plant seeds of doubt that Jesus will ever forgive you. It's dangerous, right? And this one's weird. I don't know why they even added that. And in saying this, Jesus declared that all foods are clean. no. This has nothing to do with <laughs> foods, right, in that sense. Like Jesus entered into his heart and into his belly and goeth into the, in the drought, purging all meals. And they're like, in saying this, Jesus declared, they're adding to the Bible and saying that it has something that has nothing to do with this. Daniel 3.25, um, the Son of God has changed to a Son of the gods. Wow, that is blasphemous. Romans 8.28, adding in, um, are fitting into his plan. So to change this speaks to press predestination, right? And, and this is barely recognizable as a translation. Like, 
it's just weird. I, like some of these things, I just it's just disturbing. It's saddening to me that people are creating Bibles and are remo- you know, changing what God had to say. And here's a dangerous one that says even the worst sin uh, cannot, you know, uh, separates from God. And that's scripture accurate, but if we keep um, if we're keeping the commandments of God, there's nothing that can pull us away except for our free will. So if we disobey God's commandments and we choose to walk away, God won't pull us back. God respects our free will and he'll call us, you know, call to us, but he won't enforce himself on us. And so again, it's really a problem with paraphrasing um, the Bible. An example, um, take some extra liberty, uh, which is weird why they add this. Okay, this is the one I was talking about earlier. This is super ironic. The Bible says that if any man taketh away the words of this book, right? And then they change it and says, if anyone taketh away or distorts the word of this book or prophecy from that one, he will share the tree of life in the New Jerusalem. So they're literally adding words to the verse that says, if anybody take away words or, or you know, change this, change this book. Like, the act of, I don't know, you get it, right? Like, that's, I can't even, it's silly, sad. There's a lot more, I'm going to spare you. Just believe me when I say that um, there are a lot of if you want to read the Bible in its pure form, read the New King James. Sorry, the King James. Not the New King James, not the NIV, not the AS. Just read the King James. It's the only one that actually has a, a historical translation. Um, learned men, you know, changed the words, mystifying what was plain, right? The change in the words were undertaken by people like Origen, Eusebius, and Jerome in the first century and, and fourth century, sorry. And, uh, you know, today people are trying to change the words of the Bible to make it more plain, but in reality, they're mystifying and and you know causing people to uh, to 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 astray so why translate it differently when god's word was written given satan studied the prophecies of the savior's advent and from generation to generation he worked to blind the people to these prophecies that they may reject christ at his coming religious teachers in the bible read in the light of their own understanding and traditions and the people do not search the scriptures for themselves when we actually look into the catechism as an example, right? Verse 37, I mean, sorry. Um, uh, when we read in the catechism and Exodus 20, that they change an entire commandment, right? So when it's supposed to show how, remember the seventh day to keep it holy, six days you labor and do all the work, the seventh is the Sabbath, and talking about God blessing it and sanctifying it and hallowing it, okay? All that is removed, and they just change it to, Keep the Lord's Day. If we actually look at the catechism, um, we find that they're literally changing the Ten Commandments. So, first commandment's still there. The second commandment, that you will have no other gods before me, is completely removed. Why would they remove that? Because Catholicism is based around idols. And then again, they completely change the... um, the, the, the Sabbath commandment. In Daniel 7.25, he shall speak again, he'll speak great words against the Most High and think to change times and laws. Okay? Which law is also a time? The fourth. So who is the beast? We'll get to this later, but it's pretty clear that anyone that is changing times and laws ultimately is the beast. Now, they may say, we shortened it to uh, remove unnecessary words that, you know, duplicate themselves, right? But what's lost when we change this? And one of the things that's lost is the chiactic structure, and let's talk a little bit about that. Um, we read here, though, that the Bible has been robbed of its power um, when it's changed, right? And talking about the not the King James, but the other versions. And the results are seen in lowering the tone of spiritual life. In sermons from many pulpits today, there is no, there is not that divine manifestation that awakens the conscious and brings life to the soul. Recommend uh, reading Christ Object Lessons. Really good uh, commentary. So, um, 
let's talk about what gets lost. And ultimately, when we actually look into the symmetry and the patterns of the Bible, we find clearly what gets lost. And one of those is the chiactic structure. So um, what's interesting is that if we were to read this, you can kind of say, well, it repeats itself. Right? It's a sign between me and you through generations. You should keep the Sabbath, keep it holy, cut off from among young people, holy, right? For the put to death, Israel should keep the Sabbath. It's a sign between me and you. And you're like, well, I kind of feel like I read some of that before. And what's interesting is that it's intended to be like this. It's poetic. And more than that, if we see the symmetry, right, it provides really focus. It provides... Um, additional um, emphasis in what is nested in the chiactic structure. And again, the chiactic structure essentially just means it's a pattern or a way to, um, you know, kind of create a, create a structure, create a pattern with words. Kind of like this, you know, kind of you can see it here. It's like the Bible is full of symmetry. And if we paraphrase it, we lose the beauty of it, as well as missing on the key concepts we just talked about. Let's do another one here. So the whole earth was one language, right? And let's go to the very, very bottom. Confounded the language of the earth. Okay, verse two, as they journeyed, verse eight, the Lord scattered them about, they journeyed, okay? Um, verse three, let's go and build a city and a tower. Verse seven, let's go down and confound them. Right? So it's just interesting how we see there's this, you know, this uh, context comes out and these kind of sub-narratives of the pride of man goes before the fall of man. Right? It's this beautiful symmetry. This is lost in any sort of thought for thought translation or paraphrasing. There's a lot of these. Um, that you could like if you just Google cactus structure Bible, I mean there's it, the whole Bible is a cactic structure, right? You can see this one here is another example of um, you know the um, cactus structure in, in Genesis, right? Google these, they're beautiful. Um, you know, the character structure of, of Revelation. Um, you know, again, just, it's it's literally everywhere. <laughs> it's these structures, right? So uh, just Google it. There's like tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of these, and they're all beautiful. They're all interesting. I love them. Okay, um, the more of this is in my course in storytelling, but ultimately um, what I want to point out is that the Bible actually has some beautiful storytelling wrapped into it. And there's an example of this is a video um, uh, called The Bible Project, where they kind of spell out um, visually, you know, almost like a, a storyline. And we're able to see kind of the way that uh, the books are organized in, in really these kind of beautiful symmetry. So again, recommend uh, The Bible Project on YouTube. Um, specifically the Old Testament one, they revised the ones, and I don't like the newer videos they did, but specifically this Old Testament group, this one right here, um, is the one that I like. So what else is interesting is repetition, okay? The next way to understand the Bible is to essentially pattern match the repetition in the Bible. We read in Matthew, um, in uh, 2 Corinthians and in Hebrew, how in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. And so this is actually established, you know, four times, once with Moses as well. So we see that this concept is we're looking for things to repeat. In Deuteronomy, um, we read that in two or three witnesses, the matter will be established. So now let's look for, um, you know, a verse in the Bible that has, that repeats itself. And we can, you know, take this and say there's, you know, is there a single verse? We find there's one in Isaiah 28. And it repeats itself in a beautiful pattern, um, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And I think what's interesting is not what is the same, but what's not the same. Now, I have a whole course in um, called um, Core Skills, where actually I just really dive deep into this. Um, but we're going to cover it just briefly here. What's interesting to me is looking for clues to like cross-reference, right? The words that are different are here and there, meaning that we should not look for one verse that repeats itself, but two verses that repeat themselves or more. So let's go back to this. 
where do we find words that are similar and how do we condense them, right? We find this verse uh, in Matthew 7, 7, and also Luke 11, 9, that say the same thing. And so we can actually start condensing this. And again, this is a condensed version of this course that I teach. Um, but really the neat thing is, is that we can take this and actually condense this down into um, a set of actions and a set of outcomes. And ultimately they're all verbs. So again, we're able to you know, go from 12 to six to three to two to one. Um, and from this, we can actually build out a formula that actually, um, and again, you're really going to need to um, read uh, to take the course course skills. It's part of my uh, mentorship course, but this one here really spells it out in detail uh, and even how I created that formula. So I highly recommend that.